I just had to do it on the YouTube. Okay, so Dr. Kazachoff? I am here. Okay. Uh, Ralph? Aye. Present. Uh, Cassie? Dr. Archer? Sorry. Present. Dr. Brundage? I'm here. Uh, Elaine? I'm here. Keith? He's not. And Tim? Here. And then staff, Kathleen? Yes. And Nancy? Janine? I'm here. Eileen? I'm here. Tanya? I'm here. Okay, and I invited somebody from the county attorney's office. Is there anybody from the county attorney's office? But Dr. Joya is here. And Dr. Joya is yeah, here. Yeah, I'm here. I'm sorry. I was muted. That's okay. Is there anybody on the call's name I didn't call? Uh, just Krista. I'm here on behalf of Kevin Cock. Okay. So you're, you're from an attorney's office? Yes, yeah, Camarado Law Firm. Okay. All right, we're ready to go. Very good. Um, all right. So, uh, has everybody had a chance to look at the minutes from the December meeting? And uh, are there any corrections or omissions that need to be dealt with? If none, um, I'd like a motion to approve the minutes. I'll make a motion. Elaine. I'll second. Thank you. Um, okay, so Jean, we'll be happy to hear from you if you're ready. Okay, on the warrant of 121520LB, we paid Kelly Services 2506 for our temporary help for COVID and also 2,653 to Kelly Services for temporary help. We paid Schneider Laboratories $10, $60, and $70 for lead tests. We paid the regular providers for three to five program for tuition, transportation, occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech therapy for a total of 318,095.57. On the warrant of 122920LB, we paid McGinnis for November computer support for 792. And we also paid Huga Community Health Network 14,901.73, and that's for our contact tracers for COVID. And we're also paying Nick Colas for um, computer support for ComCare. And we paid providers for the three to five program for tuition, occupational therapy, PT, and speech therapy for November for a total of 247,425.02. And on the credit card payment of 1128.20 to 1214.20, we bought numerous medical supplies for our immunization clinics just so we would know when we got the vaccine. And that was for 2019. 264.76 and 414.03. And then on the credit card batch of 12.15.20 to 12.28.20, we paid the language line 425.25 for both WIC clients and COVID patients. That's all I have. Um, does anybody have any questions for uh, Janine regarding the claims? Oh, 
Okay, would anybody like to move to approve the claims? I will. Brian. I will second. Matthew. Thank you. All right, thank you, Janine. Thank you. Um, Tanya, uh, if you're ready, we'll listen to you. Great, sounds good. Um, so for WIC, um, just a few updates. Our, the biggest update probably is the USDA waiver for remote issuance and physical presence. Um, those waivers have been extended through May 20th of 2021. So we're going to continue um, doing remote appointments through that time. Um, our caseload as of November was uh, 1,350, which is about 90% of our target um, compared to last year. At this time, it's about a 4.2% increase. Um, it's been steadily increasing ever since the start of COVID. Um, our show rates in December um, were down a bit, maybe because of the holiday. Um, but with these remote appointments, we're able to take walk-ins pretty easily. So that has been helping us meet our caseload a little better. Um, and walk-ins obviously over the phone, not in our office. Um, we lost one of our Cuga County vendors. Um, the airline in Cato is no longer accepting WIC, which is a big hit to our community. Um, we're now the closest grocery store for WIC participants up in the Cato area is Baldwinsville, which is in not in Cuba County, or about a half an hour drive into Auburn. So we're hoping that um, the new ownership with that store is going to be on board with WIC. Um, and we're going to try our best to, to get them um, to the point where they will again accept WIC. Um, we've tried uh, the Weedsport Surefine and Ed and Jeans in Port Byron um, a few times, and they're just not interested in um, accepting WIC. So we really want to get our Cato store back on board for those participants up there. Um, the, the other big news, we've got two new breastfeeding uh, peer support staff. Um, so these are moms who are on the WIC program right now. They've successfully um, breastfed, even with some challenges. They bring a really unique perspective to our team now. Um, we're fully staffed for the first time. We've got um, some different backgrounds, some different interests. So we're going to continue on with our breastfeeding focus this year. Um, we're starting to set up um, connections with um, ABC Cuga and Seymour Library to get our moms groups back um, back on board, whether it, it'll be virtual um, now, but it, we're looking forward to working with them closely again now that we've got these peers on staff. Um, and obviously, uh, we're, we're still anticipating a move. Um, where ABC Cuga will be our neighbors, so that we can help support um, the work that we do with them. Um, and then the, the last thing I did just want to make a little note, we're just seeing a lot of, um, you know, our caseload last month, I think we saw about 590 participants, um, and the, the staff here have been making uh, making it known, you know, that there's just a lot of crisis beyond just COVID as, you know, being quarantined or isolated. Um, we're just hearing a lot of impacts on mental health, um, being able to take care of their children and their household needs. Um, so I just kind of wanted to mention that. And unfortunate that we don't have the Nurse Family Partnership Program, but hopefully um, we can make some connections elsewhere in the community to support the mental health moms. And that's, that's all I have. Um, okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Tanya. Um, Eileen, we're ready for you. Okay, let's see if I can turn on my camera. It's trying to turn on, so maybe it will. I don't know. Um, 
So I don't know if Krista Russo wants to talk. I think she was here, do, is here. There was a hearing scheduled for McDonald's, which her firm represented McDonald's, but it got postponed due to improper service, I guess. So Krista, is there something that you wanted to, to talk about? Uh, I'm not privy to that information. I I just uh, got asked to sit on this with Ke for Kevin, <laughs> so I, I really don't I don't have a background on that. Okay, so we're really not going to be talking about the McDonald's one because, like I said, the hearing wasn't was held briefly held, but then it was put on hold because we had to reserve the okay. the party. Okay. All right. Well, great. Um, so let's go through the hearing and consent orders. The first one is with Pleasant Valley Mobile Home Park. There were numerous violations. Um, they have been corrected and a big improvement. Um, and they paid a $500 penalty. The town of Moravia um, has a new code enforcement officer and they're really being helpful and working to get a lot of the, the junk and and things removed from this site. So seeing a big improvement there. The next is with Cuba Lake Estates that they did not do their um, microbiological sample for October. And um, it was their first monitoring violation in three years. They took a makeup sample and they um, will need to distribute um, the this notification is part of the annual water quality report. Oh, they, and they paid a $50 penalty. The next is with Dollar General in Moravia. This was a violation of executive order in terms of wearing face coverings when in public. Um, they paid a $50 penalty. The next is with Napa Auto Parts and Senate. This is also a violation of the executive orders regarding face covering and they paid a $50 penalty. The next is with Five Below, which is in Auburn. Um, same thing, violation with um, people not wearing face coverings properly and they paid a $50 penalty. So that's all I have um, on consent and hearings for this month. Okay, so um, if nobody has any concerns or questions about the consent orders, I'll move to accept the consent orders. Do we have a second? I will second. Thank you. I have a quick question that's that, uh, a little bit related to what Tanya was talking about. Did Ed and Jean's market, well, no, they didn't use to take WIC, right? But they're, they do not take WIC, right? Ed and Jean's? Correct. Okay. No, they do not. I was wondering if they maybe, if that had anything to do with the uh, fact that we called them in here a couple months ago. Um, no, I think the last time we reached out, our vendor management agency reached out to them, that was last year, about a year ago now. Okay. Tanya, I was going to ask, do you have any insight why the Cato vendor got out? Is it paperwork? Is it, I mean, did they give you an idea of why they no longer want to participate? Um, is that Elaine? Elaine, I think um, what happened is it was for sale for a while and it finally sold. And there's new owners, so the new owners will have to submit new paperwork. Oh, okay. And they may not want to go through that. Okay. Right. I haven't heard if they're going to go through that or not yet. All right. That, okay. Thank you. I'm sorry. I just had a quick question, Elaine. Did, did we all adopt, before we move on, did we all adopt the consent orders as written? Uh, I, don't, I believe you. We, had a, we had a motion and a second. Um, so any opposed? Okay. Then, uh, we'll accept the consent orders. John, I, I've got a question. I'm just following up on, on the WIC, uh, the acceptance of, of the, uh, WIC program. Uh, I'm curious because I'm not familiar with, uh, the workings of the WIC program and I'm curious whether these uh, vendors are accepting SNAP uh, benefits, you know, using the, the civic card, whether 
you know, it's a problem re uh, relating to the way in which WIC is reimbursed or is there any feedback as to why they, because it would seem that any, any vendor, any market would want to you know, not turn away business. So I'm curious as to why this is happening. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. We obviously want them, you know, we'd hope that if you're going to accept WIC, that these families are purchasing other goods there too. So, you know, that's better for the business. Um, New York State has a separate vendor management agency that handles all the vendor stuff. Um, so I don't have exact information, um, but it is really easy now to accept WIC from from the vendor standpoint, because we also have an EBT card called the EWIT card, just like the new SNAP EBT card. Um, but, you know, as far as the paperwork and everything, I don't know exactly what would go into that. Um, but that's why the vendor management agency is going to help us out with this. Um, I had a quick question. Sorry. Can you hear Sorry. me? Say thank you. I had a quick question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I didn't know if you could hear me or not. Um, I caught that the hearing was postponed for the Cayuga restaurant group. Um, did they, what was the reasoning? I didn't catch that. Um, Rich is on the phone. Rich, can you hear me? Yep, here I am. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. Um, I heard that the hearing was postponed for the Cayuga uh, McDonald's, um, but I didn't hear why. I just need to make a note on that. Oh, sure. Um, well, I raised a couple of jurisdictional uh, objections. One that uh, we didn't have personal service on uh, the uh, owner operator, Courtney, um, but more importantly, the um, McDonald's is owned by an LLC and the LLC wasn't uh, named in the complaint and wasn't served. Um, and so as the owner, you know, we wouldn't be able to uh, bring an act bring it directly against the uh, the owner. So we postpone it until we can get uh, jurisdiction on both of those those entities. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All righty, so um, sorry, back to Eileen, I guess. All right, I don't really have much to report. Um, it's been so busy. Everybody in my office in environmental health has been working heavily with the vaccination clinics over the past two to three weeks. It seems like that's what we've been spending a lot of time on while we're still trying to do our environmental health work. So basically that's, that's all I have to report. Nice, short and sweet this month. Thanks a lot, Eileen. And uh, we all appreciate all the work that everybody's doing regarding the coronavirus and all the issues. Um, okay, uh, Kathleen, we're ready for you. Thank, thank you. So because we don't talk about it often enough, let's talk more about COVID-19 and coronavirus and what we're doing. Um, I guess just really to springboard off what Eileen is saying, it, it truly has been, uh, and can, it has been, and is continuing to be, but particularly with the rollout of the vaccines, push all other work aside and focus on this effort. Um, so when we have lulls, and I'll call it a lull, right? There's always COVID related work happening when we're not having a day when we're actually um, either testing or at a clinic performing it. Uh, we're taking that time to, to catch up on some of our other work, but I think you will, you will find that um, you'll see spurts and starts with some of our program areas. And um, there may come times when we don't reach a compliance date for some program or another. And that's just the way it's going to be right now. Uh, not the way we want it to be, but the way it's going to have to be. So testing, uh, we've been working very closely 
uh, with our uh, emergency management office. They've really been facilitating the asymptomatic testing, which we appreciate that seems to be gotten in a great rhythm along with the hospital. Um, uh, Nancy and I were just having some conversation today and, and we will be uh, finalizing that with the idea of transitioning the symptomatic uh, testing that we've been trying to uh, provide to supplement the community uh, at, as the drive-through at BOCES. So we hope that we may be able to transition that over to emergency management and with support from our State Department of Health counterparts. Uh, so that's in process, more to come on that. Uh, vaccine clinics, yeah. So we have been going gangbusters. The minute we get our vaccine, we turn around, we get it out the door. So we've had a number of clinics thus far. I won't even try to identify how many because I, I, I don't have the data in front of me and it's very busy. Right? We appreciate the fact that we not only have great um, dedication from our county health department staff, from members of board members, some of you who've actually worked at the clinics and, and coordinated and, and been supportive, which is just fantastic. Um, some of our county uh, employee counterparts who uh, are learning systems and uh, getting trained on how to work at the clinics, which is wonderful and the city. We've had a great cooperative from the city of Auburn and can't say enough good things about that. Uh, they had all their firefighter EMTs trained to become vaccinators and are cycling through um, many of them at our vaccination clinic to not only support our, I'll call them our stationary clinic efforts, but with the idea that when we have the opportunity they can help support mobile clinics as well. So uh, huge undertaking, huge cooperative. We love BOCES as a location, but uh, now that school is back in person, in session, um, we are only able to use that facility on Saturday, Sunday. So uh, we are looking at our secondary site options and, and maybe a tertiary site option for what I'll call stationary clinics. Um, you may be reading, we sent an update out to uh, through our media outlets uh, a little earlier today, probably about an hour or two ago it went out, to clarify what's going on with the vaccine clinics. We think there's, um, it, it's a challenge. It's been a challenge, it remains a challenge, the information that we get the, from New York State and, and how we get it and whether we get it in a timely manner. Uh, Currently, New York State Department of Health and New York State is saying they want health departments to only vaccinate a subgroup of the 1B eligible population, which uh, generically speaking, it's school personnel, public transit personnel, daycare providers. Uh, the desire is for pharmacies and mass vaccination clinics to address our older population of 65 plus and the desire is currently for hospitals and FQHCs, verifying qualifying healthcare centers to vaccinate um, healthcare providers. And there's pros and cons to that. The, the problem is that it really sends panic throughout particularly our older community and questions about how can I get the vaccine? Where can I get the vaccine? When will I get the vaccine? You know, we know that transportation is a huge issue within our community. It always has been. We know that we're a very rural community and we need to be able to bring vaccine to people, not expect people to come to vaccine at all times. Uh, so we continue to advocate through our channels as a local health department, through the regional calls that I have on an almost daily basis um, with Upstate, through Syracuse and the Upstate Hub. Uh, also through our New York State Association of County Health Officials. We hope that the state will open up the ability for us as local health departments to provide the vaccine to all eligible populations. Uh, 
and assuming we move in that direction, we can go back to what our initial plans had been, which was truly to bring some mobile vaccination clinics to the people uh, when we have the vaccine in hand to do that. Big questions on second doses of vaccine. From all that we're being told, we will be sent um, the second dose vaccine the week that it comes due. And we will be providing that second dose to all the people who received their first dose from us. So those, those plans are, are in the works as well. We would anticipate it will be the end of the first week in February when we start our second dose vaccines. Ordering vaccine, you know, again, the, we're all learning uh, every day. You turn on the news, there's new information about um, at the federal level, at the state level, where things are at. What I can tell you is that once a week, the health department, our health department, and currently um, it is me actually placing the order through the state system. It has to be placed uh, before five o'clock on a Monday to receive, you know, if we're going to receive whatever allocation the following week. So for example, on the 17th, I placed an order for the week of the 24th. And um, we're fortunate, actually, we got 200 doses last week, and we received 200 doses this week. Because of the tightening restrictions on who we are able to vaccinate right now, we are not making live open clinics uh, and registration. We are going straight to those employers of the eligible uh, populations and working with them to register uh, people for those clinics. We did this last week, um, and I don't mind sharing this because if you hear anything, I think it will help you to understand why we did what we did, but also to reinforce <laughs> the importance of not sharing the link. Uh, when we have what we're calling these closed clinics, it's not because we wouldn't love to sh give everybody a shot. It's because we have a finite amount and we are, the, the consequence of not following the rules as they are stated is that we will get no more vaccine. And we certainly don't wanna be in that position. So as the for instance, we had a clinic Friday. We shared it with some of the employers and on the whole, those employers really were quite good um, not sharing that link and registering their staff. But unfortunately, all it takes was one who let that link go. And suddenly we're seeing um, the allocated slots that we had for particular school districts, particular first responders had been booked by people who live in Freeville, Geneva, Seneca Falls, that we knew were not part of this. And they were, my friend sent me this, my friend sent me that. Uh, it shows the level of desire for people to hop on and, and get a vaccine, but unfortunately it caused us a tremendous amount of work to um, remove them from Friday's clinic and put the people who were eligible into those spaces. So we will attempt to be even more restrictive in how we register people for this week's dose allotment. But we're glad that we have the 200 doses and um, Boy, it's so impressive for any of you who have not seen um, this process. Uh, if, if you're interested at some point when we're operating this, I think you'd like to see how, how these large clinics roll out. Very cognizant, Nancy in particular, just every day throughout the clinics um, reinforces the fact that no individual will have FaceTime interaction with another for more than five minutes. And that's all part of the infection control process. We've got people spaced out, timing to come into the clinics, their, their greeting, the registration, the medical screening, then the vaccination, then the waiting area. And it's, it's unidirectional and it is smooth. It's, it's really impressive. Um, so that's what's going on with vaccine clinics at the moment. Schools uh, and sports, big topic that was dropped on us Friday afternoon. Uh, 
we know that most schools want to participate in athletics. We also know there's no great public health time to do this, right? There's there's a varying strain of, of virus, you know, that, that are coming around. We know that th things are contagious, but we are seeing our particular numbers coming down in Cayuga County. We had a lot of discussion uh, with our state health departments across the state and then in our 14 county region, the whole central New York region. We all wanna be on the same page. So um, together with our NYSEHO partners, we are formulating a template um, of requirements that schools will have to meet. There is the state guidance uh, that is put out, but this is going to be supplemented by um, we'll call it the Cuga County guidance, but it really is going to be similar throughout uh, throughout not only the Central New York region, but in particular the five of us counties who um, are considered the economic development hub. And that's where a lot of communication happens for people who don't know that's Cayuga County, Cortland County, Madison County, Oswego County, and Onondaga County. Um, as part of that, um, we are going to uh, give schools the opportunity to enact sports. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar, they're really looking beginning February 1st to June 15th to try and fit three seasons in. So it'd be six weeks, six weeks, six weeks. Um, if you have a positive person on the team, that's gonna pause the whole team for a two week time period, right? Or thereabouts. If we have a positivity rate in the region of more than five or more percent, then that's going to, uh, our recommendation is going to be uh, practice only in your schools. If it is 8% or more, no sports. And that's the regional average. And that's off the New York Forward uh, website. So we'll share that with all of you, just so that you're aware of it also. And there'll be a few other caveats that are part of this template that have to do with um, obviously cleaning and screening the participants and uh, making sure that there is a, a very uh, clearly identified, you know, someone taking the names of people who are present at any given time. The, um, if, if people are not compliant, if schools are not able to comply with this, they certainly can opt out. We know that there is one school district who before even looked at the qualifications opted out of this. It's, it's, not, um, it's not something they are choosing to do right now. Uh, there is, we're going to utilize the complaint line from New York State if people um, believe that schools are not being compliant with the written plan they need to put together, then they will have that opportunity to complain up through the state uh, complaint line the same way if they had a concern, any other concern related to COVID. There's probably more I could share with you. <laughs> Catherine, does that come back to the local health department similar to the other complaints? So if they complain up through the state, the state notifies you guys? Correct. Yep. It, it goes up the up the chain to Albany, back down to the county uh, where the concern comes from. It goes to the law enforcement, and then it comes to the local health departments via our law enforcement who receives it. And so that's really how it works now? For you. What's that? Similar to how it works now. Same process? It's, exa it's exactly the same. And my other question was, you know, just as of today, our positivity rate would be what or would it could they open now? I mean, given our cases going down a little, I mean, what is it? I'll look that up off the see, I can look off the app, but it's slightly different. So I want to make sure that I'm utilizing the same website. That I, I was curious. Yes. Yeah, I can. I can look that up while we're talking. Yeah. Um, do any of you have particular thoughts in addition to that at this point in time? Kathleen, I wanted to ask if you're going to do, if the health department is going to take over the symptomatic clinic, is that going to be with antigen testing or PCR testing? PCR, that, that's what we've been doing. And so we did make the request for some additional, because it's symptomatic. So we made the request for some additional um, 
testing kits. The, the state has been really great in providing us um, test kits thus far, but uh, we run out of them fast, right? We, we, so so cool. hopefully we have them. The symptomatic testing now is being done in cooperation with the health department and the hospital, and now it'll be different. Is that what you're reporting? So, yes, it has been our local health department. Nancy has coordinated through our various staff um, to have four nurses, uh, be they our full-time staff or our part-time staff, as well as two support staff to operate the BOCES drive-through symptomatic clinics. And that's been nearly every weekend that, that we've done that. And we know that there's a demand within our county to provide that. Um, it's, uh, it's a challenge, right? And, and with uh, our, here we go, we just found the, found the link. With our emergency management office uh, working well, doing the asymptomatic testing, uh, we, as a local health department, we want to get out of the testing business, to be honest. Uh, and the state health department can provide okay. support. We want them to be able so to they, do They'll have some nurses and you'll work with the MO and it'll go we'll, on. Yeah. We'll, 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 we'll show them the protocols as long as we have the ability, right? as long as we have the materials, the human resources and the material resources. We will do that. So today on the uh, the forwardnewyork.gov uh, in central New York, Cayuga County, uh, says test results yesterday, shows the seven-day rolling average is 5.9%. Okay. And Catherine, um, in regards to the plans that you had for the mobile vaccine, clinics, which now got quashed by this new state guidelines. Is there any way the board could write a letter to the state saying that given our patient demographic, we really think that we would benefit by being able to move forward with those mobile clinics, uh, which were already planned? Yeah, I, I think it couldn't hurt. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how the planning's happening. <laughs> so um, if, if the board is open to doing that, we certainly would be glad to share it up um, through our regional health department and hub, as well as through um, our NYSHO group to request that they send that on to, um, I, I've got one name of, a, of an Albany person, Loretta Santilli, who works with uh, local health departments that they could do that. But honestly, it, it's it's a challenge. It's a challenge for our regional people to get some of the information that we're asking for. We know that they are attempting to advocate for us also, but uh, I don't think it's clearly understood throughout the ranks um, where some of the information can be attained. Uh, Kathleen, I'd imagine that we're not the only rural county um, where a mobile vaccination strategy would be effective. So um, I'm thinking like Herkimer and Lewis and those areas, um, they, they're probably in the same predicament. And I wonder if coordinating with them might help, you know, That's maybe change idea. Albany's mind. If what I could do to start with is send something through our nice ATO group to inquire about more rural counties performing mobile clinics and would they like to as a concerted group, you know, as a more rural group, more upstate group really um, express that concern. Well, do we need a motion for this? If you'd like a letter and, and like us to draft one, that would be ideal if the board would motion to what they would like stated in the letter. I think we should state something on the order of um, a request to allow us to continue our plan with mobile vaccination clinic. Um, I'm not sure how else to phrase it. For the vulnerable community dwelling older. I mean, this is talking striker home and Boyle Center. I don't want my little old lady coming out of Boyle Center and busting her hip out and thus trying to get to Kinney's for a vaccine if you guys will go and give it to her. 
It, yeah, it may be a reconsideration of their position as it applies to rural communities and the needs that they face, asking and, them to reconsider it. And I think so we have we can make anything mobile, but right now we can only hit those one B. So exactly including that population, um, expanding the population uh, to include all one B eligible, I think would be very or and or as it expands onward, I think could be very helpful for our county. It seems, oh, excuse me. It seems to me that uh, it's not, as John said, it's it's not just Cayuga County. Really, you could say that about all of upstate New York. And I think pointing out the fact that the at the beginning of the pandemic, the hardest hit part of our county were rural districts, and especially with rural poor who don't have the transportation. And, and it's absolutely fundamental in our upstate counties that we have something, an outreach to those communities, or else we're going to have big gaps in vaccination. Okay, we'll grab something, and and Dr. Kasichov, maybe um, we'll run it by you to take a look at the half of the board. Sure, no problem. Okay. I'll be happy to share it with the rest of the board members Thanks. who have expressed interest. Great, thank you. Um, the other aspect I think we'll speak to is, um, and I'm sure Nancy was going to speak to this anyways. We've had some staffing changes, um, not because we wanted them but uh, we had two of our senior nurses accept positions with other entities. One went to a hospital, one went to a nursing home. Uh, they both happen to work in infection control, if I recall correctly. Uh, that, that's a real blow to us as a department. Our legislature did pass an emergency resolution giving us permission to hire additional staff and they adjusted the salaries to be more competitive in the hopes of attracting uh, nursing personnel to come work here. So we are uh, limited in our nurses on hand as full-time staff. We have two full-time field staff remaining, three full-time vacancies. Um, Nancy is a nurse. We have a part-time nurse who's routinely scheduled, but we have had the opportunity, fortunately, to uh, hire on some part-time staff to assist us with our clinics. But as all of you probably know, this is it's their secondary, in some cases, their tertiary job. Uh, so they are available to us as they are available to us. Um, so if you know of people, civil service has the applications on, online. We're looking at registered nurses, uh, public health nurses, which means they have a bachelor's in nursing. Um, and if there's nurses with uh, other experiences, uh, we certainly want to give consideration to them if that is something that interests them to work in public health. Uh, I guess that's, that's, I'll stop talking for the moment and I'm sure there's more that. Right. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, all right, we'll move on to Nancy. You're muted, by the way, Nancy. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Kathleen. She covered a lot. Um, I, I really don't have any other comments to add. Um, every day there's, there's just new information and the public is extremely hungry for vaccination. They are, uh, there's all kinds of calls. And I think once you sit here for a day and the calls that we take, you do understand, you gain a appreciation, even though it's by far not perfect, as to why there's a matrix for who and when vaccines are gonna be given. Because it's hard for individuals to look beyond their own need and desire for looking at a population. So we're trying to find our way with that. 
but uh, once we we're ready for receiving more vaccine and we really want to push it out when we do receive it. But I think it's very similar. What we're experiencing is definitely experienced across the the state and, and the country for that matter. In fact, I think Kathleen, last week, you know, pharmacies were given doses throughout the county that was more so than other counties had received. We, we did very well in that. My recollection to that, Kathleen, was that comparatively we did well. So that's, that's all I have to report. Um, okay, thank you very much, Nancy. Does anybody have any questions for Nancy at all? Do you, Nancy or Kathleen, do you know what pharmacies in our county have been slated to receive vaccines? All I've heard is Kinney so far, so. There's there's the pharmacy in Port Byron as well, which apparently is that um, is all, they fill their slots. They have wait lists, I think, at this point. Also, Nancy, the Rite Aid on Grand Avenue. So we got a listing last week that showed us that the three Kinney drugstores in Cayuga County were receiving 100 doses. The Herb's Pharmacy in Port Byron was going to receive 100, and Rite Aid on Grand Avenue was going to receive 100, and we were going to receive 200. So we were thrilled, 700 doses coming into our community. That was really great compared to a lot. I didn't get uh, a summary of what was being distributed this week. Right. So I don't know who's getting it. Our understanding is there may be additional pharmacies who may jump out to this. For example, Wegmans, not in our area right now, but in other areas is is signing up. But they may, and Tops, Wegmans and Tops may choose to, you know, join that opportunity. Walgreens, we haven't heard. We also know that some of these pharmacies uh, through their corporate offices are reaching out to some of our senior living centers to try and establish a contract with them to provide vaccine. Again, it's contingent upon supply. So we're aware of one adult home that's um, hoping, if not before, that by uh, end of March, that they may have opportunity for a vaccine. End of March? Correct. Uh, so by, by senior living home, do you mean assisted living like the home and Northbrook and Westminster? Yes. So, yep. In this case, the one I'm thinking of was Westminster. It's an adult home. Yep. Not till March. March 23rd. That's terrible. I think uh, the home is scheduled for the beginning of February. That's better. So again, uh, it, it's, as we know, it's very much supply driven. Dr. Kostov, I, I apologize. I just, the one thing I didn't touch on was our contact tracing and case investigation. Uh, that's continuing onward um, as when Janine reported uh, with the um, contracted tracers and investigators that we had hired, they're doing a great job. Uh, we've been using the state still at, for support, for contact tracing, our case investigations are all being done in house right now. Uh, we've seen a, a decline in our numbers. I'll, it's astonishing to me. I, I'm not, um, I, I'm glad that's the case, but I guess I'm suspect. So, you know, let's let's hope that it, it can stay and, and let's hope that we have lower numbers for the right reasons. But we know that uh, on the community calls that many of you participate in with me a couple times a week, uh, the hospitalizations are still pretty significant and you see that in our daily reports and in the hospitalizations, uh, when we have conversation, they speak to the number of people in ICU and the number of people ventilated. And that's just our local hospital. That's not speaking about the people who are going to hospital outside of our county. So, uh, and, and, and again, I know I'm preaching to the choir, the, the long-term effects that many people are having as a result of this virus are very significant. Just because they're out of isolation does not mean that they're feeling 100%. Um, and, and I think that's beginning to resonate a little bit more within our community that people, uh, it, it hits home a little bit more for people.
Um, <clears throat> before we move on, um, I did we take care of uh, having Keith come back on the board or renew his term on the board? It will be going through our HHS committee in February, so hopefully he will be able to participate with us in February. That was, we we failed to get it on our January agenda. Okay, thanks. Um, does anybody have anything else for either Kathleen or Nancy? Okay, well, thank you. Um, and we'll move on to Dr. Joya. So, uh, it looks like the vaccines uh, supplies uh, should, should get uh, some help if the uh, Johnson Johnson or Janssen vaccine comes in as a endovirus type vaccine with the DNA uh, coding for spike vaccine or for spike antigen. Uh, this question is, it seems like it's still holding up uh, with the uh, Moderna and the uh, Pfizer even with the new strains, though, in South Africa, they're worried a little bit that might not be as good as as coverage as the uh, was uh, uh, when it's first developed uh, last year for the original strains. Uh, it looks like it's it's good enough and uh, should work. Um, I think kind of confusing internationally is there's two Chinese vaccines. One's like 50% effective, the other's 80%. That's great. And the fifty percent one. Um, it's on the. Uh, I think the Merck Sharp and Dome was trying to uh, develop a couple of vaccines. They had such poor initial trials that they uh, given up on the uh, their vaccines. They're going to concentrate on trying to come up with uh, antiviral medication that works for COVID nineteen. Uh, that'd be quite a while, probably. Uh, and the basics, uh, certainly with the school sports and uh, community activities at this point, it's a good thing to be prudent for sure. Um, Try and cut down the contact, especially in a regional or uh, um, people mixing from large areas. Uh, practices uh, like they did in the fall probably is uh, Within school districts or intramurals, kind of things might might be more appropriate. Uh, uh, so, and exercise is still good, but uh, trying to do it socially distanced and not in large groups for sure. Um, and keeping up with good nutrition, vitamin D always helps antioxidants and uh, avoiding things like vaping and cigarette smoke and other pollution always helps. Out. Uh, with this weather, be careful wherever you're going. Don't get killed while well, it's on the way to the vaccination clinic. That wouldn't be good. That's about it. Um, thank you. Um, does anybody else have anything else they want to bring up to the meeting today? If not, I'll be happy to take a motion to adjourn. A motion. I'll second. All right, very good. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.